let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints this is as I said the number three of the series and I just want to take you over the uh, previous studies in summary in that we studied in the beginning that the subject of the king of the north is very much a salvational subject that it has to do with Jesus our savior who is working behind the scenes of the history of the world and then came to be born on earth as the time was right to influence the history of the world even more powerfully and then going back to, in heaven to work behind the scenes some more until finally he comes to deal with the final scenes of this earth's history we studied then that the king of the north who is he and I just uh, want to spend the moment in uh, drawing our mind back into in memory of what we studied last week that um, the king of the north when we read in Revelation in Daniel chapter 11 that in that chapter the vision that Daniel had was not a symbolic um, representation at all it was the angel coming to explain to him any questions that may have remained after all the symbols of the past the symbols of the past were the image of Daniel chapter 2 the beasts of Daniel chapter 7 and then Daniel chapter 8 the the, the he goat which represented Greece and it was all explained these symbols were explained but in Daniel chapter 11 it was explained in great detail without any symbols the king of the north was launched out in the terms of uh, the of the vision of Daniel chapter 2 in the very beginning it was told very plainly that the king of the uh, that the uh, Grecian Empire would replace the empire of Medo Persia and it was Alexander the Great that was described and then how he would die and four kings would take his place and that was the description of also of in Daniel chapter 8 how these four horns four generals took over and then these four generals they were they took over the Grecian Empire which uh, was this area here all the way down to Egypt and over to the uh, to the east which was Syria and uh, anything further over there was all part of the Grecian Empire and the four generals Cassander Lysimachus Ptolemy and Seleucus were distributing the the empire between them Cassander took the north Lysimachus took the west the uh, south was taken by Ptolemy and Syria and the east was taken by Seleucus they continued to conflict with one another until the, the the empire was dis, was placed into north and south Cassander was conquered by Seleucus and also by uh, uh, Seleucus conquered um, Lysimachus territory 
and Ptolemy continued in Egypt and the, uh, the annexed countries around that. And so there was the king of the north and the king of the south that continued from there onward. And in that vision, we saw that this was the benchmark of the entire vision that would be de describing the world history in relation to the king of the north and the king of the south, north of Palestine and south of Palestine. This is what we identified. So that being the benchmark, then any kingdom or any person that would rule in the north would be the king of the north ever after. And anybody that rules in the south would be the king of the south ever after. That's the benchmark of the study of Daniel chapter 11. So we don't come into any wrong conclusion when we come to the end. And as we studied, we discovered then as we came to Daniel chapter 11, reading there verses uh, uh, 40 onwards to 45, we saw the history of France in reference to Egypt, of the king of the north being Turkey, uh, working and fighting against France as Egypt was trying to defend itself. And that's where the king of the north continued unto verse 45. And in verse 45, we saw how he would want to put his caliphate into the glorious holy mountain, which is Jerusalem. And uh, then at that time, Michael shall stand up and the time of trouble would commence. This was the, the two studies we have already covered. And so this hour, I wish to respond to the appeals of our Saviour, because this is a saving message. We need to understand this message, because why? Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is apparently anxious for his people in the last days. If we read here, he says in verse 37 of Matthew 24 onwards, where he cries out to, the, to us in these words of the day and hour in which he will come, no man knoweth, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He gives us the picture of Noah and his time and how many people were saved who were alive at that time. How many were they, children? Only eight of the entire population of the world at that time. Why? Because they would not listen to the, to the preaching of Noah. And it destroyed them. And Jesus is saying here, at the end of the world, it's going to be the same. So what does he say with great earnestness in verse 42 to 44? Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house 
to be broken up. Therefore, Jesus is admonishing his people. Be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not. The Son of Man cometh. What are we to do? What is he saying? Watch so that you will not be caught by the thief-like hour that will, cap, uh, that, will over, that will surprise you. And then he describes the church in that period of time. In verse 45 he says, At that time, who then at that time is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? material that was necessary in season for that time. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Then he says, but there's going to be an evil servant who says in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servant, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because he is a servant who preaches that Jesus coming is soon but in his heart he says it's delayed and he gives he does not give the meat in due season. He eats and drinks with the drunken. You want to study what that means. So there it is. There's going to be people who claim to be Christians who will be caught unawares by that day because they're not watching. And that is what we concluded last week in Revelation chapter uh, 16 in the plague period where it says, Behold, I come. This is Jesus speaking again. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. This is the purpose of our, of our understanding that we want to uh, d explore. The understanding of God's word. What is he referring to? Coming as a thief. We read in the early studies what this actually means. What is, what is the coming that is he referred to? Is it the coming of Jesus in the clouds? Well, I'm reading here in Testimony, Volume 2, page 190, paragraph 1, where it says, he, he, she, she quotes his words, Watch ye therefore. And then she says, We are waiting and watching for the return of the Master who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly... He find us sleeping. What time is here referred to? Not the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find the people asleep. No. But to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary when he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. What is this coming? It is none other but the close of probation, which Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, uh, chapter 12 Verse 1 says, he stands up and then there will come this terrible time of trouble. This is what the, Jesus is warning about. This will happen just like in the days of Noah when the door was shut and nobody could enter in. But the, the ark was standing there for another seven days. 
And the people laughed. They didn't know that doom had already closed in on them. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what he is warning us about. And so we, we, I referred to Daniel chapter 12. Let us go there. Daniel chapter 12. And we read there in verse 1 to 3 very significant words that he finishes his work in the sanctuary above. He stands up and he, he declares, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and so on. It says, and at that time, at what time? What verse 45 does say? At that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So this is our consideration to what the spirit of prophecy and what Jesus was saying here, that this coming, which catches people by surprise, is identified when Jesus rises from his work in the sanctuary and puts on the garments of vengeance. This is referred to as his coming. And does inspiration identify him coming indeed when he puts on his garments of vengeance? Those who study carefully the Daniel chapter 11 know that Gabriel and Jesus is working behind the scenes orchestrating the history of the world as it is described in Daniel 11. Well, when he finishes his work, he will come and do what? Let's go there. Here he is coming in Revelation chapter 19 with his garments of vengeance. This is not the coming in the clouds as we were told by the spirit of prophecy. This is when he puts on his garments of vengeance and he's coming and nobody knows because they can't see him. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven which were in heaven, the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So this is what is mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, that there will be this terrible time of trouble such as never was. It is when Jesus finishes his work in the sanctuary, he stands up, he puts on these, these garments of vengeance, and there he is coming as described in Revelation 19. This is a similar picture as Elijah was, um, was trying to tell his, his uh, servant, Lord, open his eyes that he can see. There, as the enemy were surrounding him in Samaria, uh, he, he had perfect trust and he said, open, open the, the, the servant's eyes. And he saw then the horses with, with angels on them. 
that are there coordinating the, the warfare. This is the same thing in the end. There's the description. And it will catch people without knowing what's happening. They will see the time of trouble such as never was and be wondering what's going on. And those who should have known will then be in a dreadful state. And so what is the meat in due season to understand the timing so that we may in the right time recognize and be watching so that we will not be found without our garment on? What is the meat in due season? There it is, Daniel chapter eleven forty five. The king of the north, described in Daniel chapter eleven, verse forty five, is there going to shift his caliphate to the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And at that time shall Michael stand. This is meat in due season. To not be caught by surprise. To identify the events as we identified the events through history in Daniel chapter 11 to the very end to recognize here is an event in front of us just like the event in front of the Hebrews, in front of the Jews, when Jesus was born. In the days of the king that was the collector of taxes, it was there in Daniel chapter 11. They could have known if they would have known their prophecies. Just like today, we could know exactly what is happening in front of us. So there it is, the meat in due season is to recognize the king of the north, Turkey, putting his caliphate into Jerusalem, his headquarters into Jerusalem, and ultimately coming to his end and none shall help him in this arrangement. So there are some messages in the Bible that speak of this time beforehand, in this time of verse 45, as we see this happening, what is the meat in due season? Let's go to Zephaniah and see what Zephaniah, under inspiration, wrote here in reference to what God wants us to do at this time. This is Zephaniah chapter 2. Verses 1 to 3. Here it is. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Daniel chapter 12. A time of trouble such as never was in the day of the Lord's anger. In the Lamb, Jesus, and the horsemen coming down, conducting the terrible conflagration of the wrath of God. What is this? It is something we will see when it is happening and it will be too late to make any changes. Therefore, the meat in due season here is that we are before this decree, before the decree is made, it is finished, before it, the day is as a chaff. We are to seek the Lord. Who are to seek the Lord? All ye meek of the earth. 
the nation not desired, the people that were being persecuted, the people whom the other the unfaithful servant is is smiting. This people, what are they to do? They are saved God's people. They are they are perfectly secure, but what are they meant to be doing? You meek of the earth, seek the Lord, gather yourselves together before it happens. Before it happens. Just before it happens here, there is the council. And so it is, if we turn to Amos, Amos chapter 4, because this terrible wrath is coming, before it comes, there is something we are to do. Amos chapter 4, reading there in verse 11 and 12. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet thy God, O Jerusalem. Prepare to meet thy God. Because this terrible day of wrath is coming, prepare to meet thy God. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3, as we read. This is what we are to do. If we are the meek of the earth, if we are a nation not desired, if we are standing on the pure truth, meat in due season all the way through, then we are called upon to prepare by gathering ourselves together and seeking righteousness and seeking meekness. And that is what is referred to in the message to Laodicea. That's the message that Jesus is appealing to the people who are his people in the period of Laodicea. Let's go there to Revelation chapter 3. This is the message in due season. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and reading there to verse 19. And to the angel of the church of, La- of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It's Jesus here. He says, I know your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Naked. What was the message there in the very end when it's too late? I come as a thief. Watch that you keep your garments, that you don't find yourself naked. So Jesus is giving the message here, I want you to understand how you are situated in this period of time. The meat in due season is you think you're okay. It's going to come upon you as a thief. He says in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Because you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Buy of me. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. 
and anoint thine eyes with thyself that thou mayest see. Can you see Jesus referring here to the, what he said in Matthew 24? I want you not to be found naked because Revelation 16 is going to be the plagues where you will be found naked. The shame of thy nakedness must not be there. Therefore, I'm asking you in preparation for that time that you will not be found naked. Prepare for it by buying of me white raiment. And so, seeing we are obviously living in this time that all these words apply to, we need to come meekly before the Lord and seek righteousness, seek meekness. Otherwise, we will be caught out. What is white raiment? Let's examine the detail of what this actually means. White raiment and what is nakedness in these um, symbolic representations. The shame of thy nakedness be not revealed. When was the shame of Adam and Eve's nakedness revealed? We know very well the moment they sinned. Then the light that covered them that they did not see each other's nakedness was removed. And now they, they were ashamed and they had to hide themselves. But they covered themselves with fig leaf garments, their own covering. Well, let's go to Isaiah 64, 6 and there the, uh, the nakedness that is a partial covering of my body but is not sufficient. Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, reading there verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Like Adam and Eve, rags or leaves, covering ourselves. What is it? To be naked is to have our own righteousness. This is what nakedness means. Sin and self-righteousness. God, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, speaks to us there, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. He's telling the people of Laodicea they are naked. They have their own self-righteousness. They have misunderstood the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. They are covering themselves, thinking that they are covered. And if there is no change, what does he say there? I counsel thee to buy of me something that's going to cover you. If you will not do this, how will you be found in the day of God's wrath? How will you be found? Naked. And what was it there that we read in Revelation 16? That's the way it's written. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked. And they see his shame. What is the shame that is going to be manifest when the plagues are happening? Their own sins will be there to, dis, to, to 
reveal their self-destruction because the plagues have to do with self-destruction. People fighting each other. People caught in the winepress of God's wrath because of their sins. That is what is meant to be found naked. But he says, I come as a thief. Be aware that this is going to be your danger. Buy of me white raiment. What does it mean to buy of Jesus white raiment that we need so badly at this time? We read it in our scripture reading in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, reading there verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. This is a different righteousness. It's a righteousness that we are to buy of him. And it's called the righteousness of the saints. Let's explore scripture in reference to this so that we are under no mistaken understanding here to be caught naked at that time. Let's turn to Job 29, verse 14. Job 29, reading there, verse 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. What did he say? A robe. White raiment is what? I'm putting on righteousness. My judgment as a robe. So to put on raiment, to to buy white raiment, which is buying of Jesus righteousness. This is the message. This is the call. To buy of him white raiment. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 54 because the white raiment is righteousness not our own righteousness because that is filthy rags there in Isaiah chapter 54 we read verse 17 Isaiah 54 verse 17 No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Oh, this is the time of of warfare now. And every tongue that shall rise against thee, you know, the, the wicked servant smites his fellow servant. Every tongue that is risen against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I just love the way the scripture covers the whole material for us. As we meet the terrible onslaught of the time of trouble such as never was, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of destruction all around us, there is the beautiful statement that every weapon that is formed against thee shall not prosper, every tongue that is rising against thee shall, shall be in judgment thou shalt condemn. Why? Because you have bought white raiment. What is it? You have gained from me righteousness. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Well, we go to Jeremiah and read it further. Jeremiah chapter 23, reading there in verses 5, the the last words of 5, and on to verse 6. 23 verse 5, the last part says... um, And he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. 
In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. If we heed the meat in due season, we will buy righteousness of Jesus. We will understand what it means to have to be clothed with pure garments of judgment and righteousness, as Job talked about. To be covered by Christ's righteousness. What does that mean? I am to buy it of him. I am to gain it from him. What does it mean? There are two steps of engaging in the righteousness of Christ. One is to accept him as our personal saviour, to be justified. To be justified, even though we have sinned miserably. As I accept Jesus as my personal saviour and I accept what he has done in his cross experience, the promise is that I am covered. He has placed his righteousness upon me. Just like the prodigal son who comes back to the father and has got rags and he stinks and he's awfully dirty and the father comes and puts his cloak over his son. That's justification. But does the son remain dirty underneath? He goes, he takes him into his house and there he cleans him up, yes? And that is sanctification. And this is what the present message is all about that is being rejected by the majority of Christians today. This is the meat in due season that we need to understand. We need to understand justification, but we need to understand sanctification. What is this? Isaiah 1. 16 to 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16. And we need to do this. It says it here. He takes the prodigal son in and cleans him, or tells him to, do, to clean himself. Here it is. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is sanctification. Not merely covered by Christ's righteousness, but washing ourselves. And this is the meat in due season for us at this time. It is specified in those words of Jesus. Buy of me gold. Faith and love. Buy of me white raiment that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. The righteousness of Jesus, justification and sanctification and buy of me I sell, that you may see and watch correctly. So, before Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, in which Jesus, the Michael the archangel, stands up and it's over, before that time, what is to be our activity? Before that time, what is to be our activity? We read it there. Wash you. Make you clean. Let me read from the spirit of prophecy the expansion of this in understanding. 
It is Testimony, Volume 5. Here it is. On page 215, paragraph 4, it says, It is now that we must keep ourselves and our children unspotted from the world. It is now that we must wash our robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. It is now that we must overcome, what does that mean now? To overcome pride, passion, and spiritual slothfulness. It is now that we must awake and make determined effort of, for symmetry of character. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. We are in a most trying position, waiting, watching for our Lord's appearing. The world is in darkness. But you, brethren, says Paul, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It's right on, on, on the line, isn't it? It is ever God's purpose to bring light out of darkness, joy out of sorrow, and rest out of weariness for the waiting, longing soul. Are you watching? Are, are we waiting and longing are we in tune with the meat and due season at this time? What are we supposed to be doing? Wash you, make you clean. It is now that we must wash our robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. It is now that we must overcome pride, passion, and spiritual slothfulness. That's the present truth. That's meat in due season. Now, when? Before Jesus finishes his work and comes to in, in the garments of vengeance, as we read it there in Revelation chapter 19. What does Jesus teach in the parable of the marriage feast? where people who are accepting the call to come into the marriage, they are the people that accept Jesus as their personal saviour and they're gathered in, both bad and good, into the marriage. What does Jesus now describe when, he, when the king comes in to investigate them? Let's turn there to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And we read there in uh, verse 11 to 13. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away. Cast him into outer darkness. Now what does it say? There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Those who are called, who respond to come into the marriage even, may have been remaining in a Laodicean condition. They are the people of the judgment period. And they are in there by faith. And the investigation takes place and he says, and this is the, a parable that describes the event. Because there is somebody in there who does not, is not dressed in the wedding garment in Christ our righteousness. And he has not bought. He, he said, I'm good enough. 
the wretchedness that he doesn't even know he is. Well, we read those parables, we read the, the descriptions of Jesus when he separates the wheat and the tares, when he separates the sheep from the goats, when people come up to the door and want to come in, the, the, why, the foolish virgins. We read of those, when they will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and that in your name? We read all that and we think, well, that's going to be, we're going to meet him face to face and he's going to say that to us. That's not what's going to happen. It is during the time when Jesus arises and finishes his work that then people will discover, oh dear, can we please come in? Is there any hope for us, please? And he says, I don't know you. The door is shut. I'm sorry, you can't come in. Or those who were in were thrown out. This is the time when probation closes. That's the time for that during the plagues, that this will be the case. And they will cry out, the summer has passed, the harvest has ended, and we are not saved. Oh, what a dangerous position people find themselves in today. We've got to wait until the harvest, then he will separate the wheat and the tears. Sorry, it'll be too late when probation closes. It's now. It's now that we must have on the garments of Christ's righteousness. This is the picture. So it is very clear here now that as we study the subject of the king of the north, that scenario, we see God is calling us at this present time as we are watching Turkey doing its maneuverings. As we are watching this, what are we doing? What is the message? What are we meant to be applying ourselves to? The very things I've just been reading. God is calling us at this very time to do the finishing and the cleaning up of our life. Anything that I'm doing that is not God's way, we are called upon to respond. Let's read it very carefully very attentively under the guidance of the Spirit of God. What did we read in Zephaniah chapter 2, 1 to 3? What did we read? Gather yourselves together, O nation not desired, O the meek of the earth, gather yourselves together, seek righteousness, seek meekness. You may have some meekness, but seek the full covering, wash you, make you clean, wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb. Seek this. What is the other statement that comes into focus here? Malachi, the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. And reading there, verses 2 and 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Interesting. Meet in due season. He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fullest soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So here is the description of what Jesus will do before that great day. In verse 7 and 8, Even from the days of your fathers you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. 
But you say, wherein shall we return? Then he describes, will a man rob God? You have robbed me. Tithes and offerings, etc. And then he continues down in verse 16. And they that feared the Lord, what will they do? Spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. I will spare these people. They will go through this time of trouble and they will be spared. Why? Because they have responded to gather yourselves together. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, speak together, talk together, encourage each other, help each other because you can't stand without the help that I have provided for you. And then you will return and discern the righteous and the wicked, between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. The wicked will stand there, the evil servant the people who are Laodicea and haven't dressed themselves, they will be seen in contrast to those who have when it's too late. So here is the counsel, and the counsel continues in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In this period of time, what are we called to do? In Daniel chapter 11 verse 45, as we're seeing this happening. Daniel, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 Reading there, right through to 25. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. What are we going to be doing? Meeting together. Gather yourself together. Provoke each other. Speak of the Lord. Encourage each other. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more, so much the more as what? As you see the day approaching. Tell me, can you see the day approaching? Is it now? As you're watching Turkey, is this seeing the day approaching? That's what we're meant to be doing then. As we see this day, not forsaking the assembling and more often as you see the day approaching. Don't regard it as something I can't do. You know, oh, I don't feel well today. I think I'll stay away. You're asleep. You're not awake. This is serious. This is so serious that my Jesus who wants to save me is telling me no matter what strong a profession I am making, I need what he has told me to do. I need it. There it is in Ephesians chapter 4. As you see the day approaching, what does Ephesians chapter 4 say? Verses 11 to 14. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves because what's going to happen there? He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, dressed. That's what we are to be doing under the ministry of God's ordaining. 
And how is all that summarized? I love the spirit of prophecy. What we read in the Bible is beautifully summarized in her statements, and I'm reading it here from The Faith I Live By, page 113, paragraph 4. It says, By Christ's perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Are we doing it? We are called upon to do this so that we might be covered by his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. So what was the process? Is What are we to be doing now? We are to submit ourselves to Christ. The heart united with his heart. The will merged in his will. Aren't we blessed with the testimony of Jesus in these last days? As our new Sabbath school lesson comes out, you will be able to study it. It will be all laid out for us there. That we may do what he wants us to do because my mind is connected with his mind. My thoughts are brought into captivity to him. I live his life. This is practical. And this is what it means that we are now to buy of him our garments so that when the time comes, that the time of trouble that Jesus stands up and he is coming and it will catch people by surprise, we will not be found naked. As we as we literally, right now, see the day approaching, we see it approaching. The king of the north is Turkey. It's not the papacy. And we are seeing that he will come to his end and none shall help him, which will be the, the precursor and the ingredient of the final plagues, but, the, but putting his, his caliphate in Jerusalem and and the reaction of the nations around them doing that will be the close of probation. And we're right on the very cusp of that. And what we have just been reading is what we are meant to be doing just now. Our scripture reading that we read in the very beginning is the church that will be ready when this happens. Here it is, Revelation 19. Verse 7 and 8. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife, what has his wife done? Has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. His wife has made herself ready. Are we the church, his wife, that is making itself ready? When that time concludes, we will be in fine linen, clean and white, and we are to keep our garments so that we will not be naked when the terrible time of strife fully comes. It is my prayer that God grant us to be the people that are described in Daniel chapter 12. What was it there in verse 10? A people that understand what's going on, that are not going to be caught 
with their nakedness. What was it there? Daniel chapter 12. We want to be these people. Verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Verse 3. At that time, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. God grant us that we will be that people. Amen.